Okay, hello all, welcome. Um, I know this is the last session on the first day after some folks have had international travel. So we're gonna try and keep it lively, keep it a little fun. Um, but this is the panel on Reselect USA, reshoring, retaining, and reinvesting um, case studies. So we are thrilled to have you here. We're gonna keep it, um, keep it light, keep it interactive. So overall, we're gonna do a really quick executive summary of the case study that was just released um, this afternoon. It'll be my pleasure to introduce our distinguished uh, panelists in a mere moment. Um, then we'll have a quick discussion amongst our panelists and open it up to uh, Q a at the end. Um, so very quickly, let me um, introduce our members to my left, um, to your right. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Vegeta. He is the founder, president, CEO, and chairman of the board uh, for Quality Electrodynamics. He's also the Honorary Council of Japan in Cleveland, Ohio. It's a pleasure to have you here. You. Um, to his left, your right, we have Mr. Carvachal. He is founder and CEO of System76. Um, and to his left, your right, we have Matt Roberts. He is co-founder and president of Cheryl Manufacturing. And just one more over, uh, last but not least, we have Mr. Paul Lavoie, uh, general manager of Cary Manufacturing. Um, these gentlemen will have an opportunity to share uh, more about their firm and what they do in their firm, as well as the uh, opportunity that they highlighted in the case study in mere moments. Um, and just to give you a larger idea of the context of this conversation, so uh, our Undersecretary of the International Trade Administration, Undersecretary Gil Kaplan, charged us to uh, look at the story and the narrative around reshoring and expanding in the United States. Um, these gentlemen to my left, as well as two other firms, kindly answered the charge in sharing their stories about how they chose to either reinvest in the United States via an expansion, choosing the United States over another potential location, or bringing some part of their operations uh, back to the United States. Um, so it's actually, uh, I have to, I would be remiss if I I did not highlight the authors of the study who are up here to the front. Um, so Ms. Kim Agard, Veronica Faust, and Nick Hecker. Uh, we are very grateful for your hard work in authoring the study, which is now publicly available on the Select USA website under the Research and Reports section. Um, just to get a better uh, feel for what's in the study, and the executive summary is in the back left-hand side, uh, we looked at drivers, challenges, and overall motivation for why um, firms would choose to invest in the United States. We did this keeping in mind uh, sort of three key audiences. The first audience is for other investors that might be interested in engaging in this activity. We wanted to give them some narratives that they might identify with. The second audience is for US economic development organizations to better understand what the story is by which they could attract additional investment. And then we also wanted to highlight uh, for policymakers what the challenges are so that we can actually incur real change um, more systemically that would help incentivize this type of behavior. Um, so before I recap lessons learned, I think it'd be much more interesting to hear from the folks um, to my left. So, before we kind of dive into the discussion, I'd love to tee up if it's okay if I start with you, Dr. Fujita. Sure, sure. Um, just an opportunity to better understand your firm yep. as well as the project that was highlighted in the case study. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm uh, very uh, honored to be here and uh, um, I'm very happy to share our story with you. And uh, um, our company, uh, QED, Quality Electrodynamics, is a uh, medical device engineering and manufacturing company specialized in the uh, uh, development of uh, radio frequency antennas for the global MRI uh, providers such as Siemens, GE, Philips, you know, uh, Canon, and uh, Hitachi, to just name a few. Now, uh, you may not be familiar with what we make. What it is is that when you talk about MRI scanner, at the end of the day, you do take images of a patient and try to understand, you know, uh, for example, if we can identify a cancer uh, in a brain, I mean, you know, at an earlier stage, that may be, uh, um, you know, uh, that may provide the opportunity for physicians to come up with a better solution to address, you know, cancer. So um, our business is, to, you know, 
radio frequency antennas, they act like a camera in the co context of MRI scanner. That's what we make. And uh, uh, the, you know, the better the image quality is, the, the, you know, basically the better the device. So our device, um, we are trying to optimize the device with respect to signal to noise ratio, which uh, means that the higher the signal to noise ratios is, the better image quality you can get. So that's our business. This special project was a, uh, in collaboration with the state of Ohio, Jobs Ohio, and also the um, uh, local industries such as Cleveland Clinic and others. Um, you know, to, so we are trying to create an advanced imaging center at QED. And what it does is to bring all the researchers and physicians together to keep innovating our field. Because at the end of the day, why do we care about America? Because America is, a, is the country of most uh, number of innovations. And it's because all the you know, great people come to this country to keep uh, innovating you know, uh, uh, each field, in our case, healthcare you know, industry. But you see, um, what to me, what is interesting is, um, you see, we have great ideas. And then when we talk about manufacturing, that is another you know, very important aspect of innovation. Because even if you have an idea, if you cannot produce that what, that what that idea is, to me, it is uh, not complete. So when I started this company, QED, back in 2006, my idea was that uh, we are going to work with, uh, collaborate with all the partners, you know, local government and state government, and then, you know, federal government and NIH, and also the OEM partners to bring the innovations uh, so that people in the whole world can benefit. But I wanted to do this in, in America because, as I said, to me, the ability to be able to make things in our own country is a very important step. So uh, that's what we have been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Carl? Yeah. I'm Carl Rochelle. I'm the CEO and founder of System76. We are a Linux laptop, desktop, and server manufacturer. We also produce an operating system called Pop! OS. Our products are designed for software engineers, uh, people working in artificial intelligence and machine learning, as well as advanced computer science fields. <coughs> um, our work is um, to optimize the operating system and the hardware to provide the best possible performance and the best um, experience, um, the easiest experience to get to work quickly and easily um, from, through the operating system uh, with as few layers as possible for, uh, for those people that are working in advanced fields. In the last year, we, um, we opened a manufacturing facility in Denver, Colorado. Originally, we were, we were manufacturing our products in China, um, but we, had, um, we lacked a lot of control over the design, the kind of control that enabled us to differentiate our product from those of other, um, of other manufacturers. And in bringing the, the manufacturing in-house, we were able to control the, full, the design to better respond to our customers' needs, to respond to uh, improvements and enhancements we could produce with the product, and turn around the, the time from design to production from months to weeks, and we hope uh, soon days. Thank you. Matt? MRIs, computers, and now forks and spoons. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the well, co-founder and uh, president of Cheryl Manufacturing. Uh, we are the only flatware factory left in the United States or Canada. So if it says USA on the back of your spoon, it was made in Cheryl, New York, which is pretty basically the geographic center of uh, New York State. Um, I was running the factory for a very large company called Oneida Limited. Uh, we employed 2,500 people in this little town, uh, the smallest city in New York State. We were making three and a half million pieces a week, and then they closed it down. So my business partner, Greg Owens, and I, um, ironically, were the only people that made an offer for the factory. We bought it with the idea that we could create our own brand. And while we're making a product that is very infrequently purchased, the average person buys flatware three times in their lifetime. That's why you don't see Super Bowl commercials about uh, forks and spoons. Um, we became a dot-com company. So we manufacture, the, and, and we're a made in USA company. So we are focused on making sure that every part of the product from the steel um, to the packaging, um, to all of the manufacture, to most of our supplies, 
is of U.S. content so that we can differentiate ourselves from the competition. Um, we, our sales on the internet are growing about 30% year over year for the past six, seven years, um, and we hope to continue that. Um, we also have innovated a little bit, and you know, how can you be innovative in flatware? Um, we, we, if you go on our website, we are uh, actually through um, um, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, we are going out and uh, creating what we call affinity patterns so that we can market to a specific group that, um, that has a specific uh, design that they love or something that they, they like in their life, sort of a lifestyle type design. So it's working well for us and we've gone from six to 56 employees in the last five years. Great, thank you. Paul? Uh, good afternoon, my name is Paul Lavoie. I'm the general manager of Cary Manufacturing. We make catches, latches, and handles, and other hardware. So if you've ever opened up a first aid kit or a Stanley Black & Decker toolbox, uh, then you've used our product. So we're the ones that, uh, that keep that product closed. We've been around since 1981. We were manufacturing in the United States from 1981 to 2001. Uh, and in 2001, with a flood of, of cheap Chinese imports coming into uh, our market, uh, we had really no other choice uh, but to move our manufacturing to China in 2001. It was, a, it was just for purely survival for us to be able to just be able to function. So we moved from being a manufacturer to being a distributor of our own products. Through advances in technology and a uh, very good salesperson from Trump, that's with an F, Trump with an F, uh, who has a very large plant in, uh, in Farmington, Connecticut. Um, our founder and president, Jack Carey, was able to look at the equipment uh, that they've offered and figure out that we could, in a cost-effective manner, now move the manufacturing back to, uh, back to Connecticut. So you know, 18 years, well, 16 years later, uh, we now are becoming a manufacturer again of our own products um, for the same products that we had sent over to China. So have a 16 year gap. Uh, we were lucky we have a sister company. So some of our engineers were able, when we, when we um, out, um, moved it all over to China, we're able to work over there. So we kept some of that expertise. And of course we always have Jack, so um, to, uh, to manage that manufacturing process for us as well. Uh, but now we're about, uh, probably about 70, 80% of the volume that was being manufactured in China is now being manufactured in Cromwell, Connecticut. Uh, the more complex parts that we do, which are wing turn latches on large music cases, there's probably some back there, we, you know, some handles back there and uh, latches and things on the equipment back there that we make, uh, will be, uh, those are the kind of the tail end of what we're moving back. So still about 20% manufactured uh, in China, but with plans to make sure that we're 100% USA made. I will never look at a latch the same way again. So yes, thank you. Yeah. I will. I will keep that in <laughs> mind. Um, so you already. Some folks already started to touch on this, but just to dig a little deeper and peel back the onion. Um, so what were really the key factors? This is just a general question of the panel that drove the decision to either bring those operations back or to expand within the United States. I think Paul mentioned something that uh, that kind of struck me when. Um, we're a 14-year-old company, and for those 14 years, we've been writing lots of software, and and uh, but and we're, we produce laptops and desktops, but we're not actually manufacturing the product that we put into our customers' hands. So we we build everything around it except the actual thing that they hold on to and that we deliver to them. I think uh, I think uh, being a distributor of your own products is kind of that feeling that you get from it. You you feel powerless sometimes to to improve it, to to make it a better product, to respond to your customers when they do when they need things from you. Um, and that was uh, I think that was the key determiner to us um, about manufacturing. The key reason why we did it because it gave us the power to um, to kind of express who we are, who we were, our culture as a customer or as a company, and to respond to our customers' needs in a, in a much more um, uh, I don't, capable way than we could before. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, about that. Um, we, I mentioned earlier that we're a dot-com company, but we have two other lar very large customers. One of them is the government, GSA, and another one is a very large uh, cutlery manufacturer in Olean, New York, called Cutco. We manufacture their forks and spoons. They make the giant chef knives. 
Um, that all of that product, we we were forced when we were, the factory had to shut down to move it to Mexico. We had a very close friend, actually Greg and I met in Mexico when I was running that particular factory, and they made the product. And the idea was, if we move back, okay, um, a base of product, give us economies of scale, and then layer on on top of that. Um, the, the internet business, so we've got a, we call keep the lights on business, and then layer on the higher margin business, because uh, if some, one of the things that's a little different about us is that uh, when, when you go into a, a retail store and you buy a $100 jacket, it probably costs about $10 to make that. Uh, so 90% of that cost is in the supply chain. Most of it is at the retail store. So we couldn't compete head to head with uh, imported product from most of the flatwares made in China, Indonesia, or Vietnam right now. Mm -hmm. So we decided we're not gonna compete with China, Indonesia, and Vietnam. We're gonna compete with Macy's, Bed Bath & Beyond, Williams Sonoma. So that's who we are competing against. We're competing against brands and, and retail. But the idea of bringing back the product from Mexico, like I said earlier, was to create economies of scale for us. Thank you. Um, and keeping in mind, too, so in the Select USA Summit, so I mentioned we have multiple audiences here, probably audiences that, from different places in the room. Um, so both economic developers as well as folks might be interested in reinvesting or reshoring themselves. Um, looking at the company sort of narrative first, uh, is there something that companies should keep in mind when they start on this journey that you all have successfully closed out and continue to do? What's the like, top of mind that would be helpful for a company to know from inception of, of this type of activity. Is that right? Yeah. So, um, as I said, um, the, we came from Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, as I said, we are doing medical devices. So, Cleveland has a special meaning for, for at least our business because it has an infrastructure needed. So, um, as you may know, we have Cleveland Clinic. Case Western Reserve University, University Hospitals, Philips uh, from the Netherlands and Hitachi, uh, GE, I mean, you know, and then Canon, to just name a few. I mean, they all, you know, are in Cleveland. And uh, they also develop a, this infrastructure, supply chains together. So um, to me, um, the reason why we have been able to do what we, we, what we do today is because of the uh, network that uh, the you know the the region is going to is bringing to us. Not only that, we work very closely with local government and state government. So um, if we are starting any business, especially we, we started our business from scratch, and uh, uh, the support we were getting even at that time from the uh, city and also the state, I mean it's just wonderful network. So um, I have a philosophy that when we do anything we have to be able to win together. I mean, when our business does well, the community has to also win together. So, um, you know, throughout uh, my management uh, uh, meetings and then training, what I share is that, you know, we have to win together. And uh, that's what, you know, uh, brings more communication, I mean, more collaboration, because when we do well, Jobs Ohio, the state of Ohio, and that's the city want us to do more. So they push our back a little bit more every day. So that's, uh, I think, uh, key because at the end of the day, it comes down to people and uh, trust. So uh, that's something I can share with you. That was a great answer for both audiences all at once. <laughs> that worked out wonderfully, just brutally efficient, which is wonderful. <laughs> um, any other sort of thoughts for companies just starting on the journey? Well, first, in the first place, it's... Um, it, it's harder than you think it is, um, and you'll make pretty much every mistake in the book, uh, and you need to be, um, a term that I've coined is gently relentless. So, um, and, and case in point, for example, when you're, when you're reshoring back and you're using new equipment, we had no time studies on how long something would take. Now, how long does it make to t take to make this part? Well, we would estimate how long it would take to make the part, and then we would actually time study how long it take to make the part and realize that we weren't even close to where you know, we needed to be. So, but we needed to be where we thought it was going to be in order for it to be cost effective for us. So we had to continually look at how are we going to 
kind of re-engineer costs out of the process and become more efficient to get it to where we can be at that cost competitive level. Um, and, and again, just the mistakes that we, we were a catalog company. So when we were a distributor, we had a catalog. You could have any part you want as long as it was in our catalog. Um, so then when we started to reshore, um, the catalog kind of goes out the window because now we can do whatever we want with whatever we want and how we want to do that. So then, you know, then you're, you're kind of opening up your capabilities as well. Mm -hmm. So while you're trying to learn how to bring a manuf how to build a manufacturing organization, well, we had to do it with, with, we needed people, we needed machines, we needed people, we needed process, we needed engineers, we needed design, we needed, you know, you've got to go from, from designing the part to manufacturing to quality control. Again, our, our thing was it's harder than we thought it was going to be. It always took longer than we thought it would be. We're, you know, we're still kind of working through those processes. Um, and, you know, you'll make every mistake in the book, but, uh, you know, just gently, uh, gently relentless is, is kind of how we approach our, uh, our manufacturing. We just keep pushing it, pushing it, pushing it to get where we are. And, and we're in a pretty good place right now with it. But, but just you've got to, you know, don't give up. You got you got to be in, and you got to you know you've got to do it, and you've got to just make sure you you keep at it. Great, thank you. I think I can add that um, for us. I, I think a key to our success was a culture of creation. Mm. Inside of our company, there was time after time, and there was, there wasn't something on the market available to to fill a, a gap in our operation or the way that we operated our company. Uh, we didn't like the accounting platforms that were available to us because there was there wasn't enough automation, in them, so we. We software, uh, we software engineered a, a accounting platform. We created a, a CRM platform. We, um, we created a support platform to, uh, to help our, our company be more efficient at providing support to our customers. Uh, with each one of those and with success with each one, we grew, our confidence grew that we could probably attack any problem that came out in front of us. Manufacturing is a substantial one, is a large one. It's definitely the most um, capital intensive as well. And once, um, uh, but once it was in front of us, once we made the decision to do it, that culture of creation and, and that ownership that employees had over the projects that they, they were tasked with, um, I think helped make us much more successful than if, if uh, we, had, we had had a history of outsourcing things like CRM and accounting and these other platforms. So I'm hearing a lot of different versions of the transition that was associated with however you internalize that internal operation. But um, it seems like the common theme of persistence, company philosophy, and overall commitment to bringing things back to the US was key, um, is what I'm hearing from the conversation. Um, and I know from, I, I have a sneak preview of the report, so I know from your stories before, that uh, engaging with community partners and EDOs was uh, key in some situations to help, uh, to help the success of the overall investment. Um, could you share sort of what would be helpful for EDOs to keep in mind or share your story relating to uh, engaging with community partners? Um, I know we have some specific stories from Dr. Fujita and sure. Paul. Sure, I'd be happy to. So as I have already mentioned to you, I mean, um, you know, we started QED back in 2006. And uh, as we grew the business, there were many milestones which we hit. I'm sure any enterprise you do, there are some milestones you are going to hit, right? Otherwise, business will be gone. But um, at each stage, uh, what we made sure was to involve the community, as I said, EDO, I mean, Economic uh, Development Organization, such as Jobs Ohio, Team NEO, uh, Bio Enterprise. There are many of uh, these uh, EDOs who are trying to promote the industry uh, to the next level uh, to, to make it more infrastructure. So we always um, uh, try to involve them with our milestone so that our milestone becomes theirs. And then they almost take what we do as if they are doing that which is very important because then what happens is that, to your point, uh, we have received a, uh, the first um, industry grant from Jobs Ohio, which was a three, almost a three, point, uh, you know, three million uh, uh, USD. And uh, we used that uh, uh, funding and grant to a, uh, create this advanced imaging center to keep innovating you know, what we can do to healthcare industry. But the key is that if we were not known to this network or Jobs Ohio, we don't have even known these opportunities exist. Jobs Ohio's uh, uh, president and CEO and uh, his team came to see me 
And they said that, you know, here we want to start something very exciting to bring more innovations to the state. To the state, would you be interested in being our first recipient of, uh, you know, this uh, industry grant? I said, of course. Where is a where is a place to for, where is a place for me to sign? But you see, that's what I mean. It's a network and trust because they have seen what we have been doing for the last 14 years. So I don't, I don't have to go to them and then tell them how good we are doing because they knew exactly from day one what we have done. So I think it's very important. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm not talking about just my business, but anything we do in life. At the end of the day, it comes down to mutual trust and friendship. So that's what we need. I would say that uh, you know, win your business together with your community, where you live, and the people together, right? Because then they will become a part of success and also winning story. They want to do more because that's a, you know, a natural instinct of a human being. They want to do more. They want to do better together. So uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question in a way I should, but I Deeply. Mean, it sounds like this is a life philosophy, <laughs> okay, which I'm well, getting out of the, the well, conversation, which I'm grateful but, for. But that's probably our secret. I mean, we are working together with the community. Great. Thank you. And uh, Matt, I think you had a, a story to share with About the economic, yes. economic development. Yeah. Um, if, from, from the standpoint of the company and then from the standpoint of mm -hmm. the economic development agency, um, we, we, we were just two guys who had a dream and we didn't have any idea of how to, how to do it. We knew, I knew the process and I knew how to make forks, knives and spoons and I was pretty con convinced that we could do it. Um, the economic development agency basically held our hands through the whole process. So from, if you're a company looking to reshore, um, it's the squeaky wheel thing, um, the old adage, reach out to um, the the local other local businesses reach out to other local uh, economic development whether it be the the state federal which the federal basically uh, gives the money to the states to to, to pass out from an economic development uh, agency perspective um, I think you have to under feel that, or you have to have come into the discussion with the idea that these guys don't know anything we have to, about getting money and grants. We need to help them get through the process. So it's it, like uh, Dr. Fujita said, it is a, it is a, uh, a community minded thing. And from my experience, I was, you know, you, you, you read things in the news and you hear stories about government this and government that. I can tell you um, that every person that I worked with that was in uh, economic development was just a fabulous person that did everything in their power to help us out. Um, it was it was just an awesome experience. Thank you. And Matt, if I could follow up too. So you mentioned about company philosophy, and um, could you uh, unpack that a little bit in terms of how that might have been key in your overall investment uh, into the United States, bring it back? Right. Okay. Well, there, there, it's, it's a sort of a multifaceted answer, and I'll try to keep it under. 35 minutes, I'm kidding, Ron. Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> the, our, our, the, the city of Cheryl, okay, um, was built by the Oneida Limited Factory, which actually came from a commune. It was the most um, successful commune in the history of the United States, lasted from 1848 to 1878. And there were, if you read about it, there was a bunch of reasons why it broke up that I, won't want to, I don't want to discuss right now. But one of the things that came out of that um, uh, mentality, that one of the mentalities and ideas that came out of, or philosophies that came from that, was that every job was important. Um, and we, we, the company through the years had that same mentality. So Greg and I, our philosophy is that it doesn't matter if you're the janitor, the CEO, um, everybody is important, everybody is part of the community. Um, and when, when we were forced to move the product um, to Mexico after Oneida closed the gigantic factory, um, it was sort of a dejecting thing. Um, so our company philosophy has been family. And we treat um, all of our employees like family, 
Um, we know everybody, everybody, everything that's going on with everyone. Our kids go to the same school as them. My philosophy always was live in the community that you, that everyone else works in, um, you know, uh, so that you're, you interact and you're part of the team. So I think that philosophy does a couple things. Obviously, as from an owner's perspective, um, you have empathy and you're in the game for, um, for the, your employees. That's my philosophy and Greg's also. And then the other thing that happens is you have employees that know that they're part of the team too. They're just as important as you. I remember um, when we were very small as a company, we're really in the darkest times, one of, uh, one of the employees coming to me and said, Matt, you know, what's the chance I'm gonna have a job six months from now? I said, your chance of having a job six months from now is exactly the same as mine. Because if you don't have a job, I don't have a job. So I, that's sort of our philosophy. Um, I see a lot of companies, these gentlemen up here also, the, the small, medium-sized companies that are successful um, become part of the community and treat all the employees as, as family, pretty much. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Paul and Carl. Um, so we talked about sort of drivers and what inspired the investment coming into the US. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to a little bit of the benefits that your companies have realized as a result of your decision to either expand or reshore to the United States. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so the, the first, um, first advantage that we've gained by, by uh, reshoring our manufacturing is just our, our ability to respond to our customers and their needs. Uh, when we, when we um, launched our product in December and started shipping it then, um, it was a good product, it was a solid product, but, um, uh, but we weren't done with it. And just like the software that we develop, we, we are continuously improving the software we build. We do the same thing with hardware. So since that initial launch, um, we've already updated the product 200 times to, to, to wow. improve it um, in just the course of five months. So in the same way that we continuously improve software, we're continually, continuously improving the hardware. Um, I think that, that allows us to respond to our customers in a way that other manufacturers are incapable of doing, if only because the time from designing designing an improvement to getting it into the production chain and getting it shipped back to the United States um, limits your ability to, to, to respond in this way. Um, when I think about manufacturing, I, I kind of like small regional manufacturing um, for, for this reason. Um, even if we, we would ship our products to 65 countries, but as our, as our external um, sales grow, um, I imagine a, another factory in, in Europe that would be able to respond in the same way there rather than a Goliath of a manufacturing facility in the middle of in the United States in Denver uh, shipping everywhere. So um, I'd say that's probably the, the key. The second thing is that we are able to um, kind of express our company's culture and our, our community's culture through the product's design itself. Mm -hmm. um, whereas we were taking pretty much white box type of, of machines and then putting components in them, <coughs> we, we understood that we could do much better. We could design the, uh, the thermal control to be uh, much more uh, superior than, than what was coming from, from ODMs. Uh, we could, um, we could we wanted a, a rich and open feeling to the, the way the product looked, so so we put veneer on a computer, which is something that's uh, kind of unique, um, uh, you know, in the industry. Uh, our, uh, we build uh, computers for scientists, and to scientists and to those in Unix and Linux, uh, the Unix epoch is like a, is a I don't know, a symbol of the beginning of time for computers. So the air vent on the back of our computer is the solar system at the time of the Unix epoch. To us, these little touches are things that we can do that we can express who we are and who our customers are through the product. Um, that's only available to us if uh, uh, if we're building the product ourselves. Well, I have uh, two stories to share with you. Um, we had manufacturer a, um, a latch for a customer, uh, and in the manufacturing process, um, as we shipped the product to them, they called us up and said, one of the holes isn't lining up exactly right. Mm. So, um, so we told them, this was on Monday, and we said, listen, ship us the parts, the bad parts, ship them back to us overnight. So we got them Tuesday morning, the engineer took a look at it, saw that we had, had not lined the hole up properly, um, Went on, the, went on our machines, did a couple of samples of the part with the holes lined up properly. Tuesday night, we overnighted it to the customer. Uh, he put it back in their production line on Wednesday, said, it's perfect, make me those parts. We shipped them 2,000 parts for Friday. Wow. So if I'm manufacturing in China, you add 18 weeks to that scenario. 
So now I've cut down uh, a, you know, what would have been an 18 to 20 week solution to a problem to five working days. Um, so that customer very happy. We have another local customer that uh, came to us and they said, you know, we've been buying this, this catch, and again, we're a catalog company, so you can have anything you want as long as it's in the catalog until we start manufacturing. He says, but, but I need the loop to be bent a little bit, and I've been doing a secondary operation for the last 10 years that takes about five minutes a catch. So if you think of, you know, now you're, you're, you know, you're talking in a production thing, he goes, to bend this loop, and our engineer looked right at him and said, well, we can make the part for you just like that. And, you know, he's said, we'll just change the part number. Here's your new part number, we'll do this. He stood up and said, this meeting's over. I don't need to, you know, like, and said, he goes, I can't believe I've been doing a secondary operation for so long that you've just fixed this huge problem for me. And, and we couldn't have done it if we were manufacturing in China because then it would have been a different part. We'd have got through that process. It wouldn't be enough volume to support what he was for us to be able to bring it in uh, from China. But those are just two examples of, of you know, we did this for financial reasons, but for customer service and quality reasons, we now have a significant advantage over our competitors. So yeah. we're you know, allowed to be much more responsive. Yeah, actually, we were having dinner last night and um, talking to these guys. We have a, our computer is an internal chassis and an external. And the external comes off so you can add components, remove components, the normal things that you want to do with a, with a computer. And um, we use thumb screws in the back of our computer. But I always wanted to use a latch because that would be better if, if you didn't have something that was loose off the computer that you had to keep store of. A, a latch is going to stay on there forever. Carl, we can handle it. So I, I, <laughs> So I ask these guys. <laughs> so I can design a latch, and, and uh, with your soft tooling, I can just you know come over there and you can make it. And there you go. I said, yeah, yeah, we can do it. <laughs> uh, that's uh, uh, that's value to me that I didn't know I even had available to me. You know, that's something that uh, that it's good uh, good for us, and it's worked well for you. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, happy to hear that things are happening <laughs> on the margins of, yeah. of the Select Say Summit, and then also it seems like the shortened sort of production time ability to customize is much greater. The opening of potential associated with customizing product for clients and customers is huge in terms of the innovation that um, the nearshoring of operations bring. Well, and, and don't underestimate the market demand for products that are made in the USA. Mm. You know, we went to visit, you know, we provide products for McMaster Car for their catalog. So I went out to visit with them and, you know, they kind of opened the catalog and said, can you make this, 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 this? And we had never made them before, these parts, but we we're like, sure, we can make all those. So they're like, great, because we're buying them overseas now and we would much rather, you know, have them sourced here in the USA. So, you know, for us, we picked up a significant amount of business from an existing customer just because we're now manufacturing here. Great. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I don't know if, the, if anybody has seen the... Um, latest out of the McKinsey Global Institute, but they did a large-scale survey of um, global CEOs and found that there's this overall trend of um, the next trend is nearshoring, as they are terming it, in terms of uh, adjusting supply chains so that they can be hyper-localized if needed um, for the purposes of what you just described. So uh, it seems like that's a global trend uh, overall, so something to stay tuned and connected into. Um, so if we can turn to Dr. Fujita and yes. Matt. Um, so I, I hear a lot of themes around local engagement, how that was key to you, um, and that that really helped your overall investment. Um, thank you so much for sharing the, the story about how you engage with your local EDO and as part of the overall persona of um, of just what Cheryl, Cheryl looks like uh, in New York. So overall, functionally, how does that engagement look like? Is that something that, who do you go to? How did you start creating those sort of connections? Is that something that you initiated the conversation or what does that look like for somebody that wants to engage deeper with their economic development uh, organization? So, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, when I started uh, QED back in 2006, mm -hmm. That, that was different from the way we do things today. Mm. Because in 2006, we were not known to anybody yet. And, uh, uh, but you know, uh, we just needed one person at that point who can make introductions to many different organizations and network. And um, uh, today, I mean, thanks to you know, all the things that uh, my colleagues do, 
uh, we have been able to make some impact in our community and beyond, mm -hmm. uh, including our you know, um, OEM customers globally. Because, for example, last year, Siemens awarded, Siemens in Germany awarded us the overall best provider of technologies in the whole world. We, we received that award. And then once again, you know, once we have these uh, uh, moments, it's very important for us to also credit uh, partnership with uh, uh, EDOs and uh, you know the state, state, state government, and local government. So, I mean, now what's happening is that we know who is uh, responsible for what programs, you know, at the state level mm -hmm. and also local level. Mm -hmm. So the conversations can take place anytime without uh, any, you know, uh, 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 tedious uh, processes. Okay. So that's what I meant by uh, establishing a partnership based upon the trust and friendship. So I think uh, there is no secret to it, to it at the end of the day. We just have to keep working on it and then keep expanding your network because at the end of the day, you cannot do anything by yourself. Everything we do is a you know, outcome of the successful collaboration and that's what I value at my company with my colleagues. So, I mean, once again, I'm not uh, uh, answering uh, directly to your question, but I mean, to me, it, it's a people. It comes down to people. So keep, uh, uh, you know, celebrating the relationship that uh, we have with people and partners. Great. Thank you. Um, our relationship with the economic develop, development agencies is, is uh, uh, one where we keep in constant contact with mm -hmm. them. Um, we're always asking, you know, not only what programs are out there to help us, what other companies are there coming in that maybe have to, want to ask us some questions about what we did, what we did that was a mistake, mm. which was a lot, and what we did that worked. So if you have a company, you want to, you want to uh, bring reshore uh, a, a business to a specific area, not only reach out to the economic development agency, but ask them about other companies that are there that have maybe learned lessons learned. Uh, because now what's happened with us is, and it's, we discussed this this morning, and we've discussed it over dinner last night, um, is we're, you, you can get a grant you can get a low interest loans, um, you can get all of those things, and you can have a business model and a PowerPoint presentation. Well, they don't use PowerPoint anymore. I'm dating myself, probably. <laughs> um, but you gotta have people. One of the issues now, and we're working with economic development agencies uh, regarding this, is apprenticeship programs. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you have um, that full, um, uh, that 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 a, a, a solution. Um, I was trying to think of the, the the term. I had a senior moment, but um, you have the solution of the people, the equipment, the location, and obviously the the financing. Um, but like I said earlier, we we now work with our economic development agencies to lobby in our state government to come to Washington, D.C. and tell them what we need as a, as a group of manufacturers to go to, go to the next level. So um, that's how we've sort of evolved with our economic development people. And a shameless alliteration, I keep on thinking, the people pipeline, right? So you just uh, really, it's, it's the core of any, any business and thinking through how you can establish partnerships. Right. Oh, another P. People pipeline par partnerships, a different type of P3. Um, P cubed. Yes, P cubed um, to look into that. So I know we're starting to get into our potential Q&A time. So just one last question for uh, Paul and Carl, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, so again, we're getting really into the nitty gritty. We're going to go into tactics, right? Tactical um, strategy. Do you have any sort of tactical or strategic lessons learned from your overall uh, experience investing in the United States and doing this activity? Um, I, you know, get it, with us, it, it really is kind of getting the process down, mm. right? I mean, how do you, you know, you're, uh, we, we had to build a new workforce for 
uh, for us to be able to manufacture here. And then while we were building the workforce, we needed to build uh, those processes as well. So we needed to make sure that we had you know, quality programs in place, that we had manufacturing protocols in place, that we had um, design protocols in place. You know, we had to have a, you know, make sure that we were working off of, uh, you know, our, our, you know, our drawings change frequently. So making sure that we're working off of the, uh, the most current version of a drawing which goes to the production floor. And we make hundreds of thousands of parts for thousands of customers. I can't imagine anything goes wrong. <laughs> you know, so it was, uh, so when we looked at, at bringing all of that back and bringing thousands and thousands of parts back, um, sometimes our, you know, our, our heads get a little, um, you know, get spun around a little bit with just trying to keep ahead of, of everything that we're doing. So, you know, tactically with us, it really came down to, you know, how do we build the process? And, and you know, quite frankly, you know, you're building it a, a brick at a time and a day at a time, right? Mm -hmm. So. You know, I'm always, I'm always, I always overestimate how much I can get done in a day, but I always underestimate how much we get done in a month or a year, mm. right? When you look back, you go, wow, look at where we used to be and look at where we are today in our processes. Now we're not where we need to be, but thank God we ain't where we used to be, right? So we're, you know, as long as we keep, uh, we keep moving along. So I think from a, a tactical perspective, it was really kind of paying attention to that to that process and you know, building that infrastructure, uh, building that mindset and building the processes to make sure that we're managing that, uh, that whole new, for us, that whole new manufacturing uh, part of our business. Uh, Great, thank you. I think I can add two things. Um, if, you're, if you're cutting metal, don't go cheap on your laser cutter. <laughs> that uh, uh, going cheap can be, well, it'll come back to bite you. So, don't do that. Um, the second thing is um, just get to the point where you ship. Shipping a product is, is harder than you think. You, I mean, when you, especially when you're a perfectionist, there are so many little things. You, you don't feel like it's ever ready, just ship. Just get, get that product out, and um, once it starts shipping, you'll find that the people that receive it, they, they love it more than you thought you, they, 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 better, more than, than what you thought you put into it even. Uh, so uh, yeah, get your product out there and ship. Great, thank you. Um, so at this point, we would love to open it up to the audience. If there's any questions, there's a microphone, and I see we have a question already in the front. Um, I'm sorry, I think there's a microphone, yes. I don't think I need a microphone. Okay. <laughs> So in our case, it, it was automation. So our case, it's it's you know we take um, going from having a very labor intensive process to now having these sophisticated trump machines. That uh, I have one operator that operates. We have a, a sophisticated uh, laser punch press and then just a laser, that operator operates both of those machines. And during the downtime, when those machines are actually running, he's doing other tasks as well. So now I have, you know, I can do this with one person where it was taking me, you know, multiples of people, you know, five, 10, 15 people to do those same processes. So for us, it's really through that, all of that automation process and an efficiency process. We're totally different than that. We, well, not totally. We have auto, we're the most automated flatware factory in the world. Um, if you go, we're, but we're not automated like these guys are, or this guy is. Um, the way we skin the cat is we, we, we have a different business model. We're, we're, a, we're really, it's, we call it factory to table. Okay, so when we make a fork and a spoon and a knife, it goes from the factory directly to the customer. So we cut out that, that, that retail chain. And I, I, would, I would recommend a lot of people, when you're looking at getting into the, something that is a type of product that, that it is in the, in the retail realm, that you look at the internet. Because brick and mortar stores are, are going the way of the buggy whip. I'm sure they're gonna re-engineer themselves and there's going to be something there. But when a company uh, like Macy's decides they're gonna close 100 stores and their stock goes up, um, that's an interesting little uh, financial conundrum that um, sort of flies in the face of traditional retail. But that's how we did it, okay? Yes. If I may, to answer your question, I mean, what we make is not a commodity. I mean, it's not a mass-consumed product. Yet, uh, you know, as you just said, 
uh, labor is, uh, of course, um, you know, something we have to address. So we, uh, um, do, we, do, we do deploy like automation. Uh, many um, uh, automated testing, and then we are even uh, bringing some robot to to do something, you know, repetitive uh, uh, processes that uh, may result in uh, uh, expensive cost if you are to use a human labor. So, I think we have to work uh, smart and effective because we are, you know, uh, facing competition from China. So, I mean, anything we can uh, do, we can, you know. Uh, uh, do in a smarter way, we have to do it. Thank you. Um, thank you. Are there any other questions from the group? If you don't mind also just identifying yourself um, and letting us know, that'd be great. I'm Shaq Farsak, I'm the commercial Wisconsin. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm hearing a lot of technology advantages, not just in terms of the machines, but also in terms of the processes being refined that are associated with uh, either the sales version, uh, the retail side, or, or the production side that are, are efficiencies that are being gained that makes sense to bring the, these operations back. Something that um, came up in the report as a potential challenge to keep in mind, and uh, as Dr. Fujita has very kindly pointed out, the intensity and the perspective of people seems to be central to the success of no matter what type of production. We have a variety of products that here, but it seems like a common theme running throughout is just how important people can be uh, in making sure that the operations in the US work, just like any business. Um, other themes, are there other sort of uh, key components that you kept in mind that are associated with your investment that you thought um, might cut across these different sort of industries. So for example, we talked about technology, we talked about labor, um, is, we talked about community partnerships. Is there anything that was part of the secret sauce that you just wanted to touch on, uh, or is it a three trio secret sauce, which would be okay too? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. We talked about it this morning with uh um, Gil Kaplan, um, or I mentioned it. If, if you go through the, the um, I, I think about 18 million manufacturing jobs went overseas between 2000 and probably 2015 or 2016. When we say those jobs went away, the people didn't go away. Um, and many of those individuals, some of them got retrained, some of them went into some other type of business or job that they didn't like. In our, in, in our situation, we had this hu huge factory with people with many, many years of experience. So we knew, well, we thought we knew, and we ended up, I guess, maybe getting lucky. We knew that there was a pool of employees because if you have a group of employees in any of the, these companies and they've been around for years, um, you, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a specialty. So you have a skill set that sort of allows you to be good at what you're doing. If you're making cabbage patch dolls or you're making automotive uh, parts or you're making uh, flatware. So when we made the decision to come back to Sherrill, New York to manufacture knives, forks, and spoons, we wouldn't have done that if we didn't have a core group of highly skilled uh, people that, could, that knew the whole process. So um, that was really part of the secret sauce for us, is knowing we had a, we had a pool of employees. And that's why I, I always talk about training, training, apprenticeships. Make sure you've got the human capital available to you. Great. Thank you. And as a friendly reminder, too, so um, Select USA is always here to be a partner. As you have questions looking about expanding your investments uh, or considering reshoring, we have some tools at our disposal, such as information from Census Bureau that actually can get down to the county level, looking at what the uh, certain demographics are as far as <coughs> education, workforce, uh, information that might be relevant to find those sorts of clusters of highly qualified people that might have very specialized skills. Um, and we also are also very happy always to introduce if folks want to connect with their local economic development organization. We're very happy to facilitate that conversation, particularly in the context of uh, keeping your investment or expanding your investment in the United States. Uh, so please feel free if it's a little awkward, hey, I've been in my community for uh, many, many years and I'm not quite sure where to start. Uh, we're happy to be that first starting point or that first uh, point of contact to facilitate 
facilitate more deep introduction into um, resources that you might not be aware of in your respective geographies. Um, and I think we're starting to come up on time if there's any last questions. Um, but we are just extraordinarily grateful for the expertise, the experiences, um, and really the meaningful stories that um, you all have shared. So for folks that might want to check out in more detail the information online, um, the reinvestment case study is available online now. It's live on the SelectUSA website. All you have to do is go to selectusa.gov. Uh, click on the research reports section and you will find a glossy report where you can learn more about these fantastic stories. Um, and gentlemen, I just want to thank you very much for reinvesting in the United States and thank you for sharing your expertise. Please join me in, uh, in thanking the gentleman for coming. Thank you. Thank you.